Number 1. And if I told you that Palazzo Grassi is the last great building built in Venice on the Grand Canal? Yeah, this is precisely the last patrician residence built in the city before the Republic of Venice decayed. Thus marks the end of a great age. We are in the 21 century, when the exasperations and excesses of the Baroque had a bit tired, and you felt the need to undress the decorations and golden stucco, to return to a sober and elegant style, which would return to the origins of the classic traditional lines of architecture of ancient Rome. Here comes the neoclassicism, that is a new classicism, ancient but very modern. And in the lagoon the Palazzo Grassi is the representative sign of this new artistic movement, in good company with the Titrola Fenice and the Church of San Simeon Piccolo, which is the very first thing you see in Venice if you arrive by train. The history of the palace is rather troubled, having had so many owners, each of which has adapted it to their needs, not always respectful or suitable for such a dwelling. But let's go step by step. It is the beginning of the 700 when the family Grassi, economically wealthy, bought a noble titluil by a noble title. Grassi fresh fresh nobles decided to erect a palace that could celebrate and manifest this new social status and their greatness. Greatness that was exclusively economic, since they never had a role or weight in the institutional and governmental life of the city. Moved by a great fervor, they bought a series of properties located between Grand Canal, Campo San Samuel and the Calle behind. It is 1732. The family moved to the already existing and prosperous residence on the Grand Canal, which is already a good fortune, but for Giovanni and Angelo Grassi, it was not enough. Then, still putting their hands back to their substantial heritage, between 1736 and 1745, they also bought all the other neighboring properties. A large lot of irregularly shaped, that of a trapeze, came out. For the construction of their great home they did not call any architect, but that Giorgio Massari, a student of Longina, who was completing the construction of the neighboring Carazonico. How to say, the grass of the neighbor, not, is always greener, Apollos was commissioned that was solemn and imposing, with a luxurious and elegant interior. So it was and in 1748 the first stone was laid. Unfortunately, the Masari in 1766 had time to die without being able to complete the work, but the works were so advanced that it was not necessary to replace them, and they were safely completed after only six years. A building whose layout follows the shape of the lot, and therefore takes a trapezoidal shape and is articulated around a large central courtyard and a back garden, with a ground floor, a noble floor, a second and an attic. Three floors in which the individual elements seem to have been carved in the typical Istrian stone, an imposing and slender facade, but at the same time capable of expressing all its likeness in the paragressive passage from the base to the crowning cornice. The scanning of the openings forgets the geometry and the regularity of the Renaissance and Baroque palaces, to return to the examples of the Byzantine and the Venetian flowery Gothic. Inside, the magnificent perspective game bank atrium courtyard staircase extends a space that seems to have been conceived as a space to accommodate. The idea of placing the staircase in a position opposite the main entrance is extremely interesting and intelligent, because to reach the main floor, you need to reach the staircase, and then walk the entire hall and the courtyard. A choice, that of Masari, almost theatrical, forcing us to travel all the ground floor, making us participate in all the monumentality of space. Also worthy of note is the side facade on Campo San Samuel, which gives access to the interior of the building. Once you have crossed the entrance, the inner courtyard opens, which as we shall see later was closed by a glass roof. The ground floor is colonnaded, which offers a pleasant play of perspectives, the first floor and the second one with windows. The life of Palazzo Grassi was not so simple. Since in 1772 the family became extinct with the loss of Paul, last male heir, the building has changed many properties, not all have however, brought benefits and respect, but then led him to the current state. Among the many owners we certainly remember Giovanni Stucchi, an industrialist of Swiss origin, owner of a mill at the Judeca, now home to the homonymous and luxurious hotel, which had the merit of bringing electricity to the building. This was followed by the Venetian Real Estate Company, which was a cross and delight. It was the first step towards the museum destination, had the internal courtyard closed with a Murano glass structure, had a small theater built inside the courtyard, but had the other the ancient and original paving of the 
courtyard in grey trachyte and white drawings in Istrian stone, replaced with one in polychrome marble, which although inspired by the original, cannot compensate for the serious loss. Giovanni Agnelli and the architect Gay Allenti. The first restoration 1984 is an important year as Palazzo Grassi SPA and became the property of the Fiat Group of the then President Av. Gianni Agnelli. It is with the property of Agnelli that the first major restoration is carried out by the architect Gay Allenti. The building came to this moment as a confused place, where it was difficult to understand how much had remained of the original dwellings desired by the Grassi, and how much it was fruit of the unfortunate interventions of which he was the victim. The works directed by architect Allenti were conceived by a principle of respect and reconstruction of the structural integrity of the building, capable of making us enjoy today in palace that is more similar to the original. The beautiful era of fiat ended in 2003, with the death of the lawyer Agnelli. After only two years the building was bought by the current owner, the French magnate François Pinault, looking for a container to display his private collection of modern and contemporary art. The new owner decided to renovate and modernize the building, and entrusted the work to a Japanese Archie star. Tadao Ando. The Japanese architect made a minimal and non-invasive, sober and neutral, playing mainly with the light, natural and artificial, as Palazzo Grassi was born following a clever play of lights, that entering from the entrance to the water and the courtyard, shaped the interior space, and because in an exhibition container the light is nothing else the added work of art. Ando did not disappoint the expectations, and did not betray his language always characterized by simple and neutral lines, combined with beams of light that with their refraction shapes the space. The museum does not have a permanent collection, but is constantly updated and transformed according to the artists and their works and installations. It is a structure that, although rigid, merges with the exhibition functionality that allows a perfect usability of the spaces, designed it was born as a home for the exaltation of the grassy family, and has become a wonderful, perfectly functional reception space. So you could find on your trip to Venice the building closed for refurbishment between an exhibition and another well, I recommend you plan a new trip to the city, because the museum certainly deserves a visit. Number 2. On the island of Torcello, there exists an ancient white chair that local legend names as the throne of Attila the Hun. The chair is large, of solid stone, and certainly has the air of unyielding dominance that one might expect of a seat fit for the mighty leader of the Hun. There is one problem with this legend though. Attila never went to Torcello. Indeed, there is no evidence that any Huns ever set foot on the island. So for whom could such a seed have been made? Is there any evidence connecting it with the mighty Hun? In 452 AD, Attila the Hun and his armies descended upon Italy, leaving a swath of destruction in their wake. Led by their fearsome leader, the Huns pillaged cities like Altinum and Aquileia. The latter city was in fact so devastated that it was never inhabited again, and for centuries it wasn't even known precisely where the city had stood. By some miracle, Attila turned back when he reached the Po River, though the reason for his retreat is unknown. Although Attila did not visit Torcello, it did end up being settled because of Attila. As news of Attila's armies reached the towns and pasture lands of Italy, entire cities were relocated as people fled to safer ground. The island of Torcello received a large influx of refugees from the town of Altinum, after it was destroyed by the Huns. Although the Attila moniker adds some notoriety to the chair, the reality is that it more likely was used by an administrative official on the island. Two interesting common suggestions are that the chair belonged to the Magister Militum of the region, and that it belonged to the local bishop respectively. The white chair, which has famously been referred to as Attila's throne, is most likely the chair of a magistrate of the city that was later founded on Torcello, a city that would eventually become the mother city of the founders of Venice. This leads to the question, what magistrate was it? One possibility is that it was the chair of the Magister Militum of the region. Magister Militum was a term in the late Roman Empire, referring to a supreme military leader within a province or region.
It was used to refer to an officer who was second only to the emperor in terms of military authority in his realm of influence. There is literary evidence that, in the second century, the Roman fleet used the nearby harbor of Altinum and nearby islands for anchorage. The city of Altinum was also used to provide housing for the Roman array. Additionally, evidence exists that a major Roman road passed through the area where there would have been a Roman military station. There is possible archaeological support for this from the case of a grave that appears to have belonged to a soldier. This literary evidence, however, dates to the 2nd century not the 5th century, so it is unclear what presence the Roman military had in the area at the time, let alone if it was the main base of a magister militum. It would make sense for the Roman military to place bases of operations on the islands just off the coast since the barbarian raiders threatening the empire at the time were mostly horse-riding nomads who would have been inexperienced with using boats and ships required to reach the islands. As a result, a military presence on islands would have been a good defense strategy for the Romans. There is, however, little literary or archaeological evidence for a significant military presence on the islands in the 5th century. It is also possible that the chair is the cathedral or bishop's chair of the Bishop of Torcello. By 639 AD, a cathedral was built on the island that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Also, according to tradition, the Bishop of Altinum fled with the populace to the island. It is also believed that relics in Altinum were moved to Torcello. The destruction of Altinum may have resulted in the Bishop of Altinum becoming the Bishop of Torcello. The possibility of the chair being a cathedra is not unreasonable since the use of cathedra by bishops to sit during council meetings or deliver sermons dates to the earliest days of Christianity. One issue with this hypothesis is that there is still a lack of literary and archaeological evidence for the presence of a bishop in the town in the 5th century AD, which is when the chair is believed to have been made. The earliest mention of a bishop and cathedral in Torcello is the early 7th century, well after the traditional founding of the settlement on the island. All theories regarding the origin of this mysterious chair suffer from the same lack of literary or archaeological evidence. This does not mean that none of them could have happened. It simply means that there is not enough evidence to come to a conclusion on which one is correct. Like many mysteries, we may never know the full story of the chair or how it got to Torcello. It may very well not be contemporary with the founding of the settlement at Torcello and actually date to a much earlier or later time period. One thing that is almost certain, though, is that it did not belong to Attila the Hun. Number 3 on October 12, 1846, William Spencer Cavendish dropped by the studio of Raphael Monti, in Milan, Italy, to inquire about a lady. Cavendish was the sixth Duke of Devonshire, widely known in England as the Bachelor Duke. He had eight of the finest homes in Britain. He had 200,000 acres of British soil. He had a banana named after himself the Cavendish, cultivated in his gardens, and soon to become the world's most popular variety. And now, at 56, he wanted a certain young woman, demurely and paradoxically hiding behind a veil of stone. Veiled figures, usually carved from marble and suggesting a face or body partly obscured behind fabric, had first become popular a hundred years earlier, in the 1700s. The effect is an illusion, of course, enabled by translucent marble and a sly composition. It is no more real than a lady being sought in half onstage, a kind of parlor trick for late Baroque sculptors to show off their chops. But as illusions go, it's mesmerizing, and sculptors competed to put all manner of subjects under see-through garments, from the Virgin Mary to Mary Magdalene. Cavendish was friends with Antonio Canova, a fellow bachelor and popular Italian sculptor, who adored a veil Christ carved by Giuseppe San Martino in 1753, and declared that he would have given up ten years of his life to create such a masterpiece. Monty was certain he could do it. Though he was only in his late twenties when Cavendish came by, he had proven himself a preternaturally gifted sculptor. Like the Duke, he had inherited his vocation.
His father, Gaetano, had a prominent sculpture business, and Monty learned at his site as well as at the Fine Arts Academy in Milan, where he earned a gold medal at 20. He then spent four years in Vienna, sculpting busts of the Austrian royal family, before returning to Milan, just as the Austrian Empire was solidifying its grip on much of Italy. The Duke was convinced. A few days after meeting with Monti, he left the young sculptor with a substantial deposit, worth about £6,000 today, for one veiled Vestal Virgin. When the sculpture arrived in England, in the spring of 1847, the Duke apparently displayed it in his villa west of London, known as Chiswick House. But in 1999, it moved to Chatsworth House, the likely inspiration for Mr. Darcy's estate in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and the stand-in for the home in the 2005 film version of the story. In one of the film's most tender moments, Kara Knightley encounters Monty's masterwork in the home sculpture gallery, and in the veiled woman's visage, she seems to find the compassion she had not yet discovered in Mr. Darcy himself. For the Duke, the veiled virgin was one sculpture in a vast collection of white marble that he had been building for thirty years. But for Monty, it was a game-changer. In 1848, a year after sending the Duke his prize, Monty joined the revolt against Austria. When the Italians lost an early battle, Monty left for London, never to return. And there the Veiled Virgin became his signature motif, a parlor trick for the elite to display in their homes as conversation pieces. Indeed, he helped inspire a whole cottage industry of veiled women, mostly carved by Italians, who made of these anonymous virtuous women a subtle symbol of patriotism. In 1851, when the Great Exhibition opened in London, the Crystal Palace was crammed with some 100,000 supposed examples of the white man's progress, from machinery to art. Several sculptures by Raphael Monti were among them, representing Italy. One of the sculptures is an overt allegory, a colossal man holding attributes of Italian heritage, from music to silk making to the visual arts. Three other sculptures were of young women, all of them in veils including the Duke's Veil Virgin. By then, Monty was established in London as something of a commercial artist. His art was popular, his workshop was busy. Sculpture itself, so easily copied through casting, was becoming seen as commercial art. Yet Monty strove to portray his sculptures as fine art. When he discovered that one of his works, sitting in a London gallery, had been photographed without his permission, his representative voiced Monty's concern that it would be pirated in clay or porcelain by some of those persons who are to be distinguished from artists as art manufacturers. He was right to be worried, at least from a practical standpoint. When his sculpture of a veil nymph was removed from the Great Exhibition to be photographed, it came back with three fingers missing. Monty was at least as concerned about Italy itself. Shortly after the Great Exhibition opened, Monty served as a spokesman for the Italian sculptors at a reception, toasting their English hosts with a vow to repay their hospitality on the banks of the Po and the Tiber. About ten weeks into the show, however, a correspondent for the The Times of London reported that Austria had succeeded in solidifying its grip. Every pass, every fort, every city gate is in her indefinite possession. As the reporter noted, the total destruction of Italy's push for independence was at hand. When the show was over, Monty was a celebrity. Some six million people had filed through the Crystal Palace, about 42,000 a day. One of his sculptures, in particular, had been a major draw. A Circassian slave in the marketplace at Constantinople. It depicted a nude woman sitting on the ground, with a long bare back and a veil over her face. The veil, critics believed, was the real Krautlisser and they weren't happy about it. It was a trick a trivial accessory they wrote, captivating and surprising as a novelty, but beneath the dignity of sculpture as a recurring motif. Nevertheless, Monty persisted. Around 1860, when he carved the veiled lady now in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, such figures were clearly associated with the Risorgimento, the Italian unification movement. The veil, masking any distinctive features, suggested every Italian woman. She was the Britannia, the Lady Liberty, of Italy. By 1870, however, when Italy finally united and the Austrians were gone, Monti was in poor shape. He was in his sixties and deeply in debt. He reportedly never went out after dark, fearing he would encounter someone he owed. In his later years, he had mostly worked as a designer for silversmiths and porcelain makers like Wedgwood. He had sold his carving tools. 
He had never married, yet he had a community of men mostly fellow bachelors who were artists or connoisseurs, and found expression in the making or collecting of sculpture. In the last year of his life, Monty lived as a boarder in the home of a German watchmaker, in the West End of London. He died there in October 1881, just a few miles from his Vale Virgin in Chiswick House, with a fellow sculptor at his side. Number 4 it's hard to imagine not knowing, or being able to find out about the people, lands and cultures around the world. The internet has made it possible to acquire extensive knowledge with the click of a mouse. And before the internet, books, television and other media were readily available sources of information. In the not-too-distant past, however, people could only imagine what lay beyond the scope of their land. Enter Marco Polo, one of the greatest voyagers of all time, think Indiana Jones without the stuntman, whose writings have influenced other travelers for centuries. At the time that Polo embarked on his sojourn, Western Europeans knew very little about the countries Polo visited. China in particular was a mystery, because it's surrounded by treacherous mountain terrain, deserts and oceans. Before travel from Europe to China became commonplace, information and goods from far whale ands were obtained primarily from people who travel the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a series of trade routes that allowed merchants to transport goods such as silk and precious gems from Central Asia to Europe. Marco Polo's travels on the Silk Road and other ancient trade routes, which took him farther than any European before him, were chronicled in his book The Description of the World. Marco Polo was born in Venice in 1254 and raised by his mother. His father, Niccolo Polo, was a successful trader who spent most of Marco's childhood traveling with Marco's uncle. The two men returned to Venice when Marco was a teenager, only to find out that his mother had died while they were gone. During their travels in China, Marco's father and uncle made an unlikely friend in Mongol ruler Kublai Khan. Khan asked the explorers to return to China with a hundred or so missionaries and priests to teach his people about Christianity, as well as holy oil blessed by the Pope. The duo enlisted Marco in this mission in 1271 when he was 17. It was easy obtaining the holy oil, but the group had less success commissioning missionaries. Two friars were sent by the church, but they turned around and went home. All in all, the trio spent 24 years on the road, winding through a variety of treacherous and beautiful landscapes in the Middle East, Central Asia and China that span more than 24,000 miles, 38,624 kilometers. The bulk of their time, 17 years, was spent serving Khan's court in China. On the way to see Kublai Khan in China, the group traveled via trade routes in countries such as Persia, Indonesia, China, and India, see the map at Metropolitan Museum of Art for their specific route, where they learned about new products, including porcelain, coal, silk and the compass. They also viewed paper money for the first time. As you can imagine, the sojourn took a great deal longer than it would in today's world of planes, trains and automobiles. The Polo family also had to contend with the elements. Rain, snow and other inclement weather caused the trip from Venice to China to be a three and a half year trek. Another factor in this delay is the belief that Marco was very sick along the way for nearly a year, possibly with malaria. The group finally reached Chengdu, China, in 1275. Marco was introduced to Khan and quickly won him over. The Mongols, to whom Marco referred as Tartars, had ruled China and other Asian lands since they took them by force in the 13th century with their fierce horseback warfare. Traditionally, the Mongols lived as nomads, however, leaders such as Genghis Khan recognized that a successful empire would have to be built on different principles. As such, the Mongols supported foreign craftsmen, merchants and traders. They also welcomed religious missionaries, and even recruited better educated foreigners to supply administrative skills that the Mongols lacked. Khan took such a liking to Marco that he made him a courier of the court, supplying him with a passport of gold, and required him to travel to the ends of China and back. These travels made Marco the first European to see the width and breadth of the country. Marco also claims in his book 
that Khan appointed him to a position equivalent to governor, although detractors say that he probably topped out as a low-level official. Overall, Marco viewed China as a hotbed of industry that far surpassed the rest of the world in terms of technological and cultural advances. Despite these luxuries, Marco, his father and uncle decided to skip town after 17 years in Khan's court. They foresaw political unrest, the Chinese were growing resentful of the Mongols and the aging Khan. However, Khan refused to allow them to leave at first. Luckily, salvation came in the form of Persian emissaries, who arrived to request a princess for Khan's great-nephew. Khan decided the Polos would be among the trusted crew to transport the princess by sea. Life was anything but ordinary for Marco following his return home to Venice in 1295. Very little is known about Marco's personal life, although he is believed to have married a woman named Donata and had three daughters, Fantina, Lalella, and Moretta. Marco didn't put pen to paper about his travels until he wound up in prison for his role in a battle against the city of Genoa. Unfortunately for Marco, Genoa handily defeated Venice, and he was sentenced to a year for his military activities. He made good use of that time, however, by dictating the story of his journey to and from China to a fellow inmate by the name of Rusticello, a known writer. First published in French, Marco's book has been warped into more than 150 different versions, thanks to the inaccurate translations and editing done by the monks and printers who reproduced it. To top it off, some scholars believe that Rusticello embellished portions of Marco's original dictation to make it more interesting, so some people doubt the truthfulness of the tales. Critics claim that Marco would have included references to the Great Wall of China, chopsticks and the Chinese practice of foot binding, had he really made it that far across the country. Loyalists, however, assert that the really big parts of the Great Wall hadn't yet been built by the time he visited. In addition, he detailed the usage of paper money, which no other European before him had described. Whether or not you believe that his journey took place the way he described it, Marco's literary work has had a massive influence throughout history. Not only was he the inspiration for the popular pool game Marco Polo, see games kids play for official rules, but also his descriptions resulted in Europe's first maps of Asia. What's more, his travels inspired many other explorers to hit the road. In fact, Christopher Columbus was in search of Marco's described location of the Orient when he stumbled upon America in 1492.